this video I'm looking into one of Jane Austen's most fascinatingly ridiculous characters, Mr. William Collins from Pride and Prejudice. He's pompous, self-important and unintentionally hilarious. Everything you could want from a comedic figure. But beneath his absurdity, Mr. Collins plays a crucial role in highlighting the social and economic pressures of his time. So let's take a closer look at him and see what makes him a memorable character. Mr. Collins is the heir presumptive of Longbourn, the Bennett family estate, due to a legal entailment that prevents Mr. Bennett's daughters from inheriting. Nothing can clear Mr. Collins of the iniquitous crime of inheriting Longbourn. This impending inheritance gives Mr. Collins a strong sense of entitlement, and he believes that his future possession of Longbourn makes him an important figure in the Bennett's family lives. As a clergyman, his position in society is respectable but not distinguished, which makes his reliance on future fortune and connections all the more important to him. Of course, Mr. Collins' most valued connection is his relationship with Lady Catherine de Bourgh, a wealthy and powerful woman who takes Mr. Collins under her wing. This association inflates his ego further, making him believe that he's far more important than he actually is. About a month ago, I received this letter. And about a fortnight ago, I answered it, for I thought it was a case of some delicacy and requiring early attention. One of the first things we learn about Mr. Collins' character comes from a letter that he writes to Mr. Bennett, informing him of his planned visit to Longbourn. Now, what makes this so amusing is that Mr. Collins doesn't ask for an invitation. He simply assumes that his visit will be welcome, believing his status as heir makes him automatically entitled to stay with the family. I propose myself the satisfaction of waiting on you and your family on Monday the 18th. This self-invitation reveals so much about his character. It shows how completely unaware he is of social norms and the feelings of others. For Mr. Collins, everything is about his own importance. He's not visiting out of affection or interest in the family. He's visiting to scope out his future estate and offer his generous proposal to one of the Bennett daughters. During his stay at Longbourn, Mr. Collins remains blissfully unaware of how little he's liked by the Bennett family, except, of course, Mrs. Bennett, who sees him as the perfect husband for one of her daughters. Mr. Collins' self-importance truly comes to the forefront during the Netherfield Ball. With little understanding of proper social decorum, he believes that it's his right to the first two dances with Elizabeth, since in his mind, her future as his wife is practically assured. Elizabeth, of course, is horrified by the idea of dancing with him, but she's too polite to refuse outright. Jane Austen describes this scene perfectly, noting Elizabeth's discomfort with Mr. Collins's clumsy dancing and his complete inability to recognise her discomfort. In the novel, Austen writes about how Mr. Collins was awkward and solemn, apologising instead of attending, and often moving incorrectly without being aware of it. His lack of social grace during the dance only serves to highlight the absurdity of his character. He believes himself to be making a grand gesture by asking for Elizabeth's hand in the first two dances, while she is merely enduring the experience. Austin, as usual, uses this moment to show how disconnected Mr. Collins is from reality. Throughout all of this, Elizabeth's reactions to Mr. Collins are filled with a mix of amusement, discomfort, and outright horror. At the dance, she watches Mr. Collins fumble through the social interactions, completely oblivious of how ridiculous he appears. In Elizabeth's eyes, his self-importance, combined with his lack of tact, makes him a figure of rightful mockery. Jane Austen gives us these moments to highlight not just Mr. Collins's character, 
but also Elizabeth's intelligence and independence. While society might expect her to be flattered by Mr. Collins's attention, she can see through his pompous facade, recognising that marrying him would mean a life of insufferable mediocrity. One of the most telling moments of Mr. Collins' stay also occurs during the Netherfield Ball, when he approaches Mr. Darcy, despite the fact that they've not formally been introduced. Now, this breach of etiquette is a major social faux pas, but Mr. Collins, filled with his self-importance, feels entitled to speak with Darcy. Without any sense of impropriety of his actions, Mr. Collins informs Mr. Darcy that Lady Catherine is in good health, believing that this will somehow ingratiate him to the wealthy landowner. This moment is key in understanding Mr. Collins's character. His entire sense of self-worth is tied to his association with Lady Catherine. So in his mind, mentioning her to Mr. Darcy will elevate his own standing. But Austin, with her usual sharp wit, shows how Mr. Collins's misguided actions only reveal his lack of social understanding. Mr. Darcy's cold and indifferent response makes it clear that Mr. Collins is nothing more than a minor annoyance. When Mr. Collins proposes to Elizabeth, it's one of the most cringe-worthy moments in the novel. His proposal isn't about love or even attraction. It's a business arrangement. Being as I am to inherit all this estate after the death of your father, I could not satisfy myself without resolving to choose a wife from among his daughters. He assumes that Elizabeth will accept because in his mind, he's offering her security and respectability. In fact, He's so certain that she'll say yes, that he doesn't even consider the possibility of rejection. I must attribute it to your wish of increasing my love by suspense, in the usual manner of elegant females. When Elizabeth turns him down, it's a shock to his system. He can't understand why she would refuse such a favourable match. His inflated ego doesn't allow him to see that his lack of charm, sense and awareness makes him wholly unappealing. And this is Austin at her best, using Mr. Collins to mock the transactional nature of many marriages of the time. One of the most iconic moments in the story comes when Mr. Bennett delivers his famous line after Elizabeth refuses Mr. Collins's proposal. Mrs. Bennett, furious that Elizabeth would reject such a good match, insists that Elizabeth must marry him for the sake of the family. But Mr. Bennett, in his typical dry manner, responds... An unhappy alternative is before you, Elizabeth. From this day, you must be a stranger to one of your parents. Your mother will never see you again if you do not marry Mr. Collins. I will never see you again if you do. Now this line perfectly captures Mr. Bennett's wit and his support of Elizabeth's independence, contrasting sharply with Mrs. Bennett's desperation. I'll be covering Mr. Bennett in a future video. Now after Elizabeth's refusal, Mr. Collins quickly moves on to propose to Charlotte Lucas and she accepts much to Elizabeth's shock. For Charlotte, marrying Mr. Collins isn't about love, it's about securing her future. She knows her prospects are limited and she makes the practical choice to marry for security rather than affection. I'm not romantic, you know. I never was. I ask only a comfortable home. Now this moment reveals another side of Mr. Collins. He's so completely unaware of the personal feelings of those around him that he fails to recognise why Elizabeth rejected him and why Charlotte accepted him. He believes both decisions revolve around him and his importance, when in reality they have everything to do with the characters of Elizabeth and Charlotte themselves. By the time Mr Collins leaves Longbourn, it's clear to everyone but himself that he has been a great source of irritation. He believes he's left a favourable impression, but in reality, the Bennett family is simply relieved to be rid of him. Oh, Mr. Collins! <laughs> when Elizabeth visits Charlotte and Mr. Collins at their home in Kent, 
we get another perfect glimpse of Mr. Collins's absurdity. He's constantly showing off the house and his connection to Lady Catherine de Bourgh, oblivious to the fact that Elizabeth finds his behaviour ridiculous. In his mind, Elizabeth must surely regret rejecting him. After all, look at the wonderful life she could have had. Castle Elizabeth, I am truly honoured to be able to welcome you to my humble abode. Of course, Elizabeth feels nothing of the sort. If anything, the visit only confirms her decision to reject him, as Mr. Collins's lack of self-awareness becomes more painfully obvious. The staircase, I flatter myself, is eminently suitable for a clergyman in my position, being neither too shallow nor too steep. So Jane Austen uses Mr. Collins as a figure of rightful mockery throughout the novel. He's pompous, long-winded, and completely unaware of how ridiculous he appears to others. Observe that closet, Cousin Elizabeth. Lady Catherine de Bourgh herself was kind enough to suggest that these shelves be fitted exactly as you see them there. Shelves in the closet. Happy thought indeed. His obsession with Lady Catherine and his blind reliance on status make him a figure of fun, and Austen uses him to satirise those who place importance and social standing over personal merit. Lady Catherine is far from requiring that elegance of dress in us which becomes herself and her talk to her. She will not think the worse of you for being simply dressed. Finally, it's important to note that Mr. Collins serves as a foil to Mr. Darcy. While both men are wealthy and hold a position of social power, they represent two very different kinds of pride. Now there I was thinking pride and prejudice had to do with Elizabeth and Darcy, but if I reflect on all the characters across the whole story, almost all of them show a sense of pride and or prejudice in their own little ways. Mr. Collins's pride is superficial, based on his connections and his future inheritance. He's completely unaware of his flaws. Mr. Darcy, on the other hand, starts out proud, but grows into a character of self-awareness and humility. In the end, Darcy's depth of character contrasts sharply with Collins's shallow self-importance. Who indeed would not be sad to be deprived of rose hings and indeed of a gracious condescension? You will write to your mother and tell her you wish to stay a little longer. Mr. Collins may be one of Austen's most absurd characters, but he also serves as a sharp critique of the values and social pressures of the time. Through his self-importance, his cluelessness, and his obsession with status, Austen creates a figure of rightful mockery. But as always, the humour in Pride and Prejudice comes with a deeper message, one that reminds us that true worth comes from character, not connections. So that's it. Mr. Collins. Oh, Mr. Collins. Thanks for joining me on exploring the world of William Collins. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thankfully, I've had um, a tip over on this, this week, this week, this month, where my channel has gone over to 10,000 subscribers. I'm completely astonished. And so many of you in this little community are giving great comments, contributing to discussion. And it's, it's, it's really invaluable because it's, yeah, it just makes it worthwhile for me, but hopefully makes it worthwhile for you as well. So again, thanks for watching, and I'm sure to be putting a few more of these together. If you're a Beatles fan and you watched the channel for the old Beatles videos, I thought the Beatles was the thing that would make this channel skyrocket. But in fact, it's turned out to be Pride and Prejudice. So there you go. That's why I'm focusing more on that. But if you are a Beatles fan, not too long from now, I'm going to Hamburg. And I will be making a video all about the Fab Four. So stay tuned for that one. In the meantime, I've got some more Pride and Prejudice to knock out. <laughs> Let's get on with it. I'll leave you with Mr. Collins. As a clergyman, moreover, I feel it my duty to promote and establish the blessing of peace in all families within the reach of my influence. 